Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 21st of the 12th month on our Creator's calendar as we have it reckoned, which also lines up with the 4th of March, 2023 on the Gregorian calendar. And we're continuing again with our reading through of the book of Hanok, or what they call it, First Enoch. And we are on chapter 53. So it says, There mine eyes saw a deep valley with open mouths, and all who dwell on the earth or land and sea and islands shall bring to him gifts and presents and tokens of homage, but that deep valley shall not become full. And their hands commit lawless deeds, and the sinners devour all whom they lawlessly oppress. Yet the sinners shall be destroyed before the face of Yahuwah of Ruachoth, or spirits and they shall be banished from off the face of his earth or land, and they shall perish forever and ever. For I saw all the messengers of punishment abiding and preparing all the instruments of Satan, or the adversary. And I asked the messenger of Shalom who went with me, for whom are they preparing these instruments? And he said unto me, they prepare these for the kings and the mighty of this earth, that they may thereby be destroyed. And after this, the righteous and elect one shall cause the house of his congregation to appear. Henceforth, they shall be no more hindered in the name of Yahuwah of Ruachoth, or spirits. And these mountains shall not stand as the land before his righteousness. But the hills shall be as a fountain of water, and the righteous shall have rest from the oppression of sinners. Chapter 54 And I looked and turned to another part of the earth, or land. The word here in Hebrew is Eretz, and it's literally the place where I will run my course, right, like a courier. But they, that's where we get the word earth from. It's also where they get the word for terra, for land, terra, eretz, it's backwards. Um, but the connotation when you say earth, people think of a spinning ball in space. And really, he's just talking about the land that you stand upon, as opposed to water, which is below it. So I try to make that distinction when I'm saying that so people don't have the wrong concept in their, in their minds there. This is, I looked and turned to another part of the land or earth and saw there a deep valley with burning fire. And they brought the kings and the mighty and began to cast them into this deep valley. And there mine eyes saw how they made these their instruments, iron chains of immeasurable weight. Now, it mentions elsewhere that the, the monarchs and the kings are judged more severely because they're given places of prominence, right? If you've ever read Josephus or Yahusuf, Antiquities of the Yahudim, and the um, Wars of the Yahudim, you can see this firsthand, in particular through the life of Herod, which Josephus or Yahusuf was intimately familiar with, being born around 36 AD and living through those times. But he, in that history, you can see exactly how Herod was, and then the righteous judgment of our creator in doing unto him what he did to others, including wiping out his entire family. But the, the monarchs of the world are judged more severely for what they're doing because they are given their places of influence and power by our creator. Just like he said to Pontius Pilate, you'd have no authority over me if it wasn't given to you from above. Right? but because they don't acknowledge where their authority comes from and they do not live by his common law or the Torah, if you will, they're going to suffer their fate. Remember, there's only two kingdoms. You're either a part of his kingdom and doing the will of your maker or you're part of the adversary's kingdom and doing his will. And the two are quite contrary to one another, as you'll see. So verse four, and it says, and I asked the messenger of Shalom who went with me saying, for whom are these chains being prepared? And he said unto me, these are being prepared for the hosts of Azazel, so that they may take them and cast them into the abyss of complete condemnation. 
and they shall cover their jaws with rough stones as Yahuwah of Ruach Oath or spirits commanded. Now, if you remember the hosts of Azazel, Azazel is the one that taught war, fighting the discrimination of or inequality through precious metals and stones and things of that nature and promulgated that among men. And kings are the ones that good armies to fight each other and do those things as his hosts. That's why it mentions the kings are the ones that this is for. It's mentioned in Yob Elim. It's mentioned in the, in the recognitions of Clement when he's talking about the history from creation until their times. But before Nimrod, before he was the first mighty man like that in rebellion against our maker, but having kingdoms and having fighting amongst one another is not from the beginning. It will not continue throughout time. And those are things that are being brought to naught by the manifestation of his coming. So it says in Mikael, the mighty man of El, or sorry, it's the who is like El, and then Gabriel, the mighty man of El, and Raphael, the healer, El is my healer, and Fenuel, or Panuel, which is the face of El, shall take hold of them on that great day and cast them on that day into the burning furnace that Yahuwah of Ruach Oth may take vengeance on them for their unrighteousness and becoming subject to Satan and leading astray those who dwell on the earth. And in those days shall punishment come from Yahuwah of spirits, and he will open all the chambers of waters which are above the Shemaim, and of the fountains which are beneath the earth. So you see, this was uh, the first judgment that he brought on by water that's been spoken of, the flood, that wiped out everyone that was subject to Satan at that time. And all the waters shall be joined with the waters. That which is above the Shemaim is the masculine, and the water which is beneath the earth is the feminine. Now, this part right here I had issues with. You won't find anywhere else where this is actually mentioned. And the uh, I don't know why it's still in there. I looked online. I was looking at the different translations or versions of the book of Hanok, and it actually reads a little differently in the other one. So we'll have to go over that sometime. But the idea of the, the waters above being masculine and the waters beneath being feminine, um, I found no other witness to that anywhere in the entirety of Scripture. There are mentions of the waters above the firmament, but it's never in the context of being contrary to the ones that are below the earth. Although there is a ruach or a spirit that's over the waters that causes it to be stormy or whatnot, and that's also mentioned in this book elsewhere. But verse 9, it says, And they shall destroy all who dwell on the earth and those who dwell under the ends of the Shemaim which is heavens, right? And when they have recognized their unrighteousness, which they have wrought on the land, then by these shall they perish. Chapter 55. And after that, the head of days, or the ancient of days, repented and said, In vain have I destroyed all who dwell on the land or earth. And he sware by his great name, Henceforth I will not do so to all who dwell on the earth, and I will set a sign in the Shemaim, and this shall be a pledge of good belief or faith between me and them forever, so long as Shemaim is above the earth, and this is in accordance with my command. And that's the rainbow, right? Which is fully explained like a signet ring and a seal in the recognitions of Clement. So very profitable if you check that out. Verse 3, it says, When I have desire to take hold of them by the hand of the messengers on the day of tribulation and pain, because of this, I will cause my chastisement and my wrath to abide upon them, saith Elohim, Yahuwah, Abruach Oath, or spirits. You mighty kings who dwell on the earth, you shall have to behold mine elect one, how he sits on the throne of esteem and judges as Azel, and all his associates, and all his hosts in the name of Yahuwah 
of Ruach Oath. Chapter 66. Now, this part, when they're judged and what's going on, is also covered in, it's the what we'd call the great throne judgment. After, when our Mashiach comes, he's going to throw Satan in prison for a thousand years. And after that time, he releases him for a time. He's going to gather together all those who willingly serve him. And then they're going to surround the, the believers that all flee to Yerushalayim. And then fire will come down and destroy all of creation. That's going to be the second great judgment. But his chosen will be protected. After that time, when there is desolation everywhere, the great white throne judgment will happen. The general resurrection of all the deceased that weren't part of the first resurrection and then you're going to have a week of years where he judges every living man, woman, child that's ever existed. And from that time, those that will be in everlasting punishment will go to their place. And these messengers will be some of the first sent there. And those that are of him will be given their place of eternal well-being. And then that will be when the new Shamayim or new heavens and the new earth are created in which righteousness dwells, where there's no tears, no sadness, no death, and no more uh, remembrance of these things. So just for context about when this, when that will be. Okay, chapter 56. And I saw there the host of the messengers of punishment going and they held scourges and chains of iron and bronze. And I asked the messenger of Shalom who went with me, saying, To whom are these who hold the scourges going? And he said unto me, To their elect and beloved ones, that they may be cast into the chasm of the abyss of the valley. And then that valley shall be filled with their elect and beloved, and the days of their lives shall be at an end. And the days of their leading astray shall not thenceforward be reckoned. And in those days the messengers shall return and hurl themselves to the east upon the Parthians and Medes. They shall stir up the kings, so that a ruach or spirit of unrest shall come upon them. And they shall rouse them from their thrones, that they may break forth as lions from their lairs and as hungry wolves among their flocks. And they shall go up and tread underfoot the land of his elect ones. And the land of his elect ones shall be before them as a threshing floor and a highway. But the city of my righteous shall be a hindrance to their horses. And they shall begin to fight among themselves, and their right hand shall be strong against themselves. And a man shall not know his brother, nor a son his father or his mother. You see examples of this in scripture, allusions to when these things happened before, where you had the 185,000 man Assyrian army that got wiped out by a messenger. When you had the Midianites, uh, the like locusts throughout the land, too numerous to be numbered, and they rose up and were fighting amongst themselves during the battle in confusion. There's different illusions of these kind of things and how it will manifest for us later on. I do believe that's also how Armageddon, what they call Haramagedo, happened. It was the battle, um, one of the last battles of World War One, I, I believe. The battle of, uh, I can't remember, it starts with an E. But there, it was the papal forces against the united what you want to call Christian forces or the, the forces of the believers there that was foretold to happen at that time. There's a lot of confusion about it now because people don't know history. But um, there was also confusion at that time where they were fighting amongst themselves and they actually did more damage. The enemy forces hurt themselves as well in confusion. So it says, verse 7 here, it says, But the city of my righteous shall be a hindrance to their horses, and they shall begin to fight among themselves, and their right hand shall be strong against themselves. And a man shall not know his brother, nor a son his father or his mother, till there be no number of the corpses through their slaughter, and their punishment be not in vain. 
in those days, Sheol, or the grave, shall open its jaws, and there shall be swallowed up therein, or they rather, and their destruction shall be at an end. Sheol shall devour the sinners in the presence of the elect. Chapter 57 And it came to pass after this that I saw another host of wagons, and men riding thereon and coming on the winds of the or from the east and from the west to the south. And the noise of their wagons was heard, and when this turmoil took place, the set-apart ones from Shemaim remarked it, and the pillars of the earth were moved from their place, and the sound thereof was heard from the one end of Shemaim to the other in one day. And they shall all fall down and worship Yahuwah of Ruach Oath, or spirits. And this is the end of the second parable. Chapter 58 <clears throat> And I began to speak the third parable concerning the righteous and elect. Baruch are ye, or you, you righteous and elect, for esteemed shall be your lot, or splendorous, if you will, shall be your lot. And the righteous shall be in the light of the sun, and the elect in the light of eternal life. The days of their life shall be unending, and the days of the set apart without number. And they shall seek the light and find righteousness with Yahuwah of Ruach Oath. There shall be shalom to the righteous in the name of the eternal master. And after this it shall be said to the set apart in Shamayim that they should seek out the secrets of righteousness, the heritage of belief. For it has become bright as the sun upon earth, and the darkness is past. Now, it mentions... Our Mashiach mentions that there's threefold reward. There's the 30, 60, or, or 100 fold reward for believers. That's expounded on by Irenaeus, where he mentions the 30 fold will have the uh, earth to dwell in, right? The 60 fold. Or they'll have like the Shamayim Yarushalayim that comes down, right? The 60 fold will be in the Garden of Eden, and the 100 fold will actually be like the messengers in the Shamayim before the presence of the Father as their perpetual dwelling place, but anyone can travel amongst these things. It's also mentioned by Josephus in his discourse to the Greeks about Hades and a few other places. Hanok in, in earlier was taken into the Shemaim, and he mentions that that's where his dwelling is going to be as his reward in the future, but it's not for yet. There's a few others that are like that as well, and that's the hundredfold reward. It's spent, it's mentioned throughout scripture how you get these different benefits and which reward you have is for what you choose to do with the truth as it's given to you. Right. But the idea of searching out the secrets of righteousness, they're written in the Shamayim. You have all of all of the word is written on the tablets of the Shamayim. And being able to search those out and read it for yourself is the heritage of belief that will come in this time where we can actually know these things more fully than we do now. Verse 6, and it says, And there shall be a light that never ends, and to a limit, literal number, of days they shall not come. For the darkness shall first have been destroyed, and the light established before Yahuwah of spirits, and the light of uprightness established forever before Yahuwah of Ruach Oath. That it's mentioned in Revelation, it's mentioned in Yeshiyahu, it, where the moon will be no more, and the sun will be sevenfold, and there, there will be no more sun because Yahuwah is the light, and our Mashiach will be the lamp, right? Chapter 59, it says, In those days mine eyes saw the secrets of the lightnings, and of the lights, and their judgment, and they lightened for a baraka or for a curse, or, or a curse, as Yahuwah of Ruachoth wills. Now, lightning in the world both can destroy, can cause fires that burn through forests, but that also brings the 
renutrients of the ground, which allows it to be fertilized again. So there, it's for Baraka or a curse. The uh, lightnings, as mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it talks about the different signs. Um, what did they call that one? There's a particular scroll that they uh, assigned it with like divination scroll is what I think they called it. But it was a four, it was a type and shadow of what you can find throughout the book of Revelation in a smaller scale. When they had lightning and thunder in certain quadrants of the sky, it would be correlating with what stars would be there. And they would have different meanings of what was happening in the world around them. And they have that written down like that. In a larger scale, you have the, the signs and the stars, the luminaries, the, the meteors, and the different things that were going on for it as a representation of what would be happening on earth that was foretold over and over again. And that's literally how Revelation is laid out. Um, so this is a type of that. If this was complete and it's not an abridged version, we might have more detail. But you have to keep in mind the book of Hanok or the first Enoch as we have it today is abridged. At best, it's an abridged version of the original. You have discrepancies in how the moon functions, which is fully made known in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You have uh, different examples of things where it's a little bit here, and then you can look at what was written in the scrolls, and it's got more. A perfect example of that, we haven't got to it yet, but in the book of Exodus, there's quite a bit that was cut out for redundancy or for whatever reason that we'll actually cover. And you can see what was really written and then what we have in our common versions. And there's like half of it's missing. In the same way, the Testament of Louis, I've mentioned this before, but he mentions in the beginning of it that Levi or Louis prayed to Yahuwah. And then it just moves on that he had a vision. But if you look at the version in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it goes through how he washed his hands, he washed his garments, he got his mind prepared. And then it actually has the prayer that he said. And everything that he did during that and then the literal fulfillment of what he asked for so you have an abridged version in the common ones that we have down but it was a lot more expansive originally that kind of thing you have to keep in mind might happen here and this is why we have things that don't quite make sense or aren't fully um aren't fully comprehensible sometimes But verse 2, it says, And there I saw the secrets of the thunder, and how when it resounds above in the Shamayim, the sound thereof is heard. And he caused me to see the judgments executed on the earth, whether they be for well-being and Baraka, or for a curse according to the word of Yahuwah of Ruachoth of spirits. So this could have been a lot larger, giving the actual instructions for the things that you can read in that divination scroll that they were actually talking about but as you see when things would happen lightning and thunder and then judgments and what it actually meant he was taught these things and it says and after that all the secrets of the lights and lightnings were shown to me and they lighten for baraka or blessing and for satisfying chapter 60 in the five or in the year 500, meaning the 500th year of Noah or Hanok's life, which would have been, he lived for 365 in the land, and then he was taken, and he was shown all these things until this time, right? This is in the 500th year, in the seventh month, on the 14th day of the month in the life of Hanok. So that would have been right before tabernacles as we reckon it if i remember correctly i might be off but it says in that parable i saw how a mighty quaking made the shamayim of shamayim to quake and the host of the most high and the messengers a thousand thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand were disquieted with great disquiet and the Ancient of Days sat on the throne of his esteem, and the messengers and the righteous stood around him. A great trembling seized me, and fear took hold of me, and my loins gave way, and dissolved were my reins, and I fell upon my face. And Mikael, the 
who is like El, right, sent another messenger from among the set-apart ones, and he raised me up. And when he had raised up, my Ruach returned. For I had not been able to endure the look of this host and the commotion and the quaking of the Shemaim. And Mikael said unto me, Why are you disquieted with such a vision? Until this day lasted the day of his mercy. And he has been merciful and long-suffering towards those who dwell on the earth or land. And when the day and the power and the punishment and the judgment come, which Yahuwah of spirits has prepared for those who worship not the righteous law, and for those who deny the righteous judgment, and for those who take his name in vain, that day is prepared for the elect a covenant, but for sinners an inquisition. When the punishment of Yahuwah of Ruach Oath shall rest upon them, it shall rest in order that the punishment of Yahuwah of Ruach Oath may not come in vain, and it shall slay the children with their mothers and the children with their fathers. Afterwards, the judgment shall take place according to his mercy and his patience. And on that day, so the, the great judgment, right? And then or the punishment that's going to happen, and then the great judgment, right? And on that day were two monsters parted, a female monster named Leviathan, or the beast out of the sea, which is also mentioned in Job, if you want to get into details about what that one is like, right? To dwell in the abysses of the ocean over the fountains of the waters. All of this is in parable form, telling things that would happen as well. But the male is named Behemoth, who occupied with his breast a waste wilderness of Dudean, on the east of the garden where the elect and righteous dwell, where my grandfather was taken up, the seventh from Adam, the first man whom Yahuwah of Ruachoth created. So if you can tell, this is now speaking, they call this part, this section, one of the... Um, one of the interpolations from Noah because it's written it's written from his perspective right it might have been originally written differently if this was the third parable that was shown to Hanok but this was recorded by Noah and he was writing from his person and i besought the other messenger that he should show me the might of those monsters how they were parted on one day and cast the one into the abysses of the sea, and the other unto the dry land of the wilderness. And he said to me, You son of man, herein you do seek to know what is hidden. And the other messenger who went with me and showed me what was hidden, told me what is first and last in the Shemaim in the height, and beneath the earth in the depth, and at the ends of the Shemaim, and on the foundation of the Shemaim. And the chambers of the winds, and how the winds are divided, and how they are weighed, and the portals of the winds are reckoned, each according to the power of the wind, and the power of the lights of the moon, and according to the power that is fitting, and the divisions of the stars according to their names, and how all the divisions are divided. So he was shown all these things, but we don't actually have a record of any of that anymore. It was known, and this is the very thing that original believers used to help interpret the book of Revelation. If you watch the, the video series, The Antichrist for Dummies, like we've mentioned, it goes over that in a little bit of, it gives the information that they had available that was written about, but all of that was destroyed. It was taken by, by Rome at that time and as it says in Second Baruch, the truth was hidden in the fourth beast. And as we see what our Mashiach walked out, he was made unrecognizable as a man and murdered, mocked and killed by Rome at the behest of his, cho uh, his people that rejected him. This is verse 13. 
and the thunders according to the places where they fall, and all the divisions that are made among the lightnings that it may lighten, and their host that they may at once obey. For the thunder has places of rest, which are assigned to it while it is waiting for its peal, and the thunder and lightning are inseparable. And although not one and undivided, they both go together through the spirit or ruach and separate not. For when the lightning lightens, the thunder utters its voice, and the ruach enforces a pause during the peal and divides equally between them. For the treasury of their peals is like the sand. And if you've ever looked at sand, it up close, which is also mentioned in scripture about the treasures found in sand. It's like, it's like little jewels, right? So for their treasury of their pills is like the sand. And each one of them, as it pills, is held in with a bridle and turned back by the power of the Ruach and pushed forward according to the many quarters of the earth. And the Ruach of the sea is masculine and strong. This is what I was talking to you about earlier, that there is a Ruach or a spirit that is over the, the waters, right? And according to the might of his strength, he draws it back with a rain, and in like manner it is driven forward and disperses amid all the mountains of the earth. So he's basically saying that the cycles of water with the waters in the land, right, are his responsibility. The the um the mountains they have the springs that come out of them like the Yarden River what they call the Jordan if you read Josephus it comes from the mountains of the north out of what uh, they call them primary water sources or like what we have an artesian well if you dig and you have water that doesn't need a pump because it has continual pressure pushing it out it's what they call a a pr um, primary water source that never runs out. That's this Ruach's doing. And those are what most springs and, and rivers that come out of the mountains are, are just like that all over the world. It's part of the cycle of water that happens perpetually. Verse 17. And the Ruach or spirit of the hoarfrost is his own messenger. And the Ruach of the hail is a good messenger. And the Ruach of the snow has forsaken his chambers on account of his strength. There is a special Ruach or spirit therein, and that which ascends from it is like smoke, and its name is frost. And the Ruach of the mist is not united with them in their chambers, but it has a special chamber, for its course is splendorous both in light and in darkness, and in winter and in summer. And in its chamber is a messenger. So these might seem confusing, but the idea is that there's everything in nature has a spirit or a messenger, if you will, that has authority over it, that controls how it functions and regulates these things. For everything from magnetism to buoyancy and density to all the, di the, the different manifestations of what happens in the seasons are all controlled by messengers delegated authority if you will and the messenger is trying to tell you a message if you look at what these things mean in scripture and how they're identified and then you see how they function in reality that's what he's trying to teach man okay we've, we've seen a lot of examples of that before but i'm just trying to go over a little very lightly real quick that's why some of this can seem a little confusing if people just read it and it, it might not make sense to you Verse 20, it says, and the Ruach of the dew has its dwelling at the ends of the Shemaim and is connected with the chambers of the rain and its course is in winter and summer and its clouds and the clouds of the mist are connected and the one gives to the other. And when the Ruach of the rain goes forth from its chamber, the messengers come and open the chamber and lead it out. And when it is diffused over the whole earth, 
it unites with the water on the earth. And whensoever it unites with the water on the earth. For the waters are for those who dwell on the earth, for their nourishment for the earth from the Most High who is in the Shamayim. Therefore there is a measure for the rain, and the messengers take it in charge. It, it asks the question, I believe, in the first or second chapter of Sirach, who can measure the rain or the days of eternity, right? It's also mentioned, I believe, by our Creator, or by Yahushua when he's speaking to Ezra in 4th Ezra. He says, can you measure the drops of rain? Right? He knows them all by measure. There's nothing hidden from him, and that's actually something that he showed to Moshe when he was on the mountain. But chapter 23, or verse 23, sorry. It says, and these things I saw towards the garden of the righteous. And the messenger of Shalom who was with me said to me, these two monsters prepared conformably to the greatness of Elohim shall feed. And then they have it breaking off. It mentions that he provides food for all flesh in the Psalms, including Leviathan and Behemoth. And again, Behemoth and Leviathan are gone over in more detail by or in the book of Job. It's mentioned in Revelation as the beast out of the earth, the beast out of the sea. That's the larger scale. But there was literally creatures like that as well at a time. So all of these things, it's the physical truth playing out the spiritual truth that would come later. You see example after example of that as well. All right, chapter 61. And I saw in those days how long cords were given to those messengers, and they took themselves wings and flew, and they went towards the north. And I asked the messenger, saying unto him, Why have those taken these cords and gone off? And he said unto me, They have gone to measure. And the messenger who went with me said unto me, these shall bring the measures of the righteous and the ropes of the righteous to the righteous, that they may stay themselves on the name of Yahuwah of spirits or Ruach Oath forever and ever. Remember that words forever and ever in the Hebrews normally Leolam Wa'ed, so unto ages and witnessed is what it literally says. The elect begin to dwell with the elect, and those are the measures which shall be given to belief, and which shall strengthen righteousness. And these measures shall reveal all the secrets of the depths of the earth, and those who have been destroyed by the desert, and those who have been devoured by the beasts, and those who have been devoured by the fish of the sea, that they may return and stay themselves on the day of the elect one. For none shall be destroyed before Yahuwah of Ruach Oath, and none can be destroyed. Remember our Mishiach says, for all live to him, right? And all who dwell above in the Shamayim received a command and power, and one voice and one light like unto fire. And that one, their first words, they baruch, or they blessed, and extolled and lauded with chokma, wisdom, and they were wise in utterance and in the Ruach of life. And Yahuwah of Ruach Oath placed the elect one on the throne of esteem, and he shall judge all the works of the set apart above in the Shemaim, and in the balance shall their deeds be weighed. It mentions in, I believe it's the Psalms, that the, the Shamayim is not even cleaning his sight, right? It was messengers that went apostate, and he's going to judge them first. Again, it mentions it right here, and we're, we're going to see that in the um, what's called the animal apocalypse coming up later on. And when he shall lift up his countenance to judge their secret ways according to the word of the name of Yahuwah of Ruach Oath, and their path according to the way of the righteous judgment of Yahuwah of spirits, then shall they all with one voice speak and barak or bless, and esteem and extol 
and set apart the name of Yahuwah of Ruach Oath. And he will summon all the hosts of the Shamayim and all the set apart ones above, and the host of Elohim, the Cherubim, Seraphim, and Ophanim. Ophanim, these are three different types of messengers, right? And all the messengers of power, and all the messengers of principalities, and the elect one, and the other powers on the earth over the water. On that day shall raise one voice in Barak and esteem and exalt in the Ruach of belief, and in the Ruach of wisdom, and in the Ruach of patience, and in the Ruach of mercy, and in the Ruach of judgment and of shalom, and in the Ruach of goodness or tovim, and shall all say with one voice, Baruch is he. And may the name of Yahuwah of Ruach Oath be Baruch forever and ever, or Leolam Wa'ed. And all who sleep not above in Shemaim, sorry about that, and all who sleep not above in Shemaim shall Barak or bless him. All the set apart ones who are in the Shemaim, shall Barak him, and all the elect who dwell in the garden of life. So again, there'll be some will be in the Shemaim, some will be in the garden of life, and some will be in the, you know, in the earth, in the Shemaim, Yarushalayim, the threefold reward, right? And every spirit of light who is able to Barak or bless and esteem and extol and set apart your Baruch name and all flesh shall beyond measure esteem and barak your name forever and ever. For great is the mercy of Yahuwah of Ruach Oath, and he is long-suffering, and all his works and all that he has created, he has revealed to the righteous and elect in the name of Yahuwah of Ruach Oath. So it mentions when our Mashiach came that I no longer call you servants, but friends for all things that the Father has made or that, that the Father has uh, given me, I've made known to you, right? And that's through his word that we know the Father through the word, which is what we call the Bible, although that's not all of Scripture. We have the apocryphal writings, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the hidden writings, if you will, of the original covenant and the renewed covenant. So that is what he gives as a precious possession to his elect ones. And it's specifically mentioned by 4th Ezra, the epistle of Clement to Yaakov on the death of Kepha, and in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is part of the community rule, and it's the prayer of the elect or the prayer of the intelligent that is so, supposed to be done on the uh, Chodeshim or the first of the first month, fourth month, seventh month, and tenth month, which are the change of seasons. That pr prayer talks about how all these things he has given to his elect ones to know our Mashiach and through him the Father. Chapter 62. And thus Yahuwah commanded the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who dwell on the earth and said, open your eyes and lift up your horns if you are able to recognize the elect one. For the horn represents your authority, right? And Yahuwah of Ruach Oath seated him on the throne of his esteem and the Ruach of righteousness was poured out upon him. And the word of his mouth slays all the sinners. Our Mashiach said that his word will judge them in the last day. Right? And all the unrighteous are destroyed before or from before his face. And there shall stand up in that day all the kings and the mighty, and the exalted and those who hold the earth. And they shall see and recognize how he sits on the throne of his esteem. And righteousness is judged before him, and no lying word is spoken before him. Then shall pain come upon them as on a woman in travail, and she has pain in bringing forth. 
when her child enters the mouth of the womb, and she has pain in bringing forth. And one portion of them shall look on the other, and they shall be terrified, and they shall be downcast of countenance, and pain shall seize them, when they see that son of Adam sitting on the throne of his esteem. And we're going to go over it in detail, but the kings of the earth are from Yahuda. It was Yahuda who rejected him when he came. These are all things that were foretold, like Yahuda Ishkiriot is the one who literally betrayed him of the twelve, and it was the Yahudim specifically the that rejected him, not to a man, but generally, and that's why they were cast out and rejected. But they represent the monarchies throughout the world as well. And Yahuda goes into that in his testament, which we'll cover in just a bit here. But I wanted to point that out. And then if you go back to Genesis, if you read about the story of what happened, he first married a Canaanite woman. All the children of Canaan were under the curse, and they weren't supposed to mix with them. So all the children that born of him, there's three sons, two of them died and one of them continued. But all of those children from, from his third son, from that Canaanite woman, they were never part of the monarchy. They never got given the, the benefit of the kingdom. And they would still have that issue, just like the sons of Simon or Shimon. He married a Canaanite and then married someone else. Everyone that mixed in with the people that were under the ban, their children would reject the truth. Because he's not a contrary to what he said. And those things were literal, okay? This is in the kings and the mighty and all who possess the earth shall barak in esteem and extol him who rules over all who was hidden. For from the beginning, the son of Adam was hidden. He was the word from before the creation began that was brought forth from the bosom of the father, right? Just like our brother was asking about with uh, Yahukin on there. In the beginning was the word and the word was with Elohim and the word was Elohim. He was the firstborn of all creation. And it was through him that the Father was pleased to make all things, right? So it says, For from the beginning the Son of Adam was hidden, and the Most High preserved him in the, pre in the presence of his might and revealed him to the elect. Just like I just mentioned, right? And the congregation of the elect and set apart shall be shown, and all the elect shall stand before him on that day. And all the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who rule the earth shall fall down before him on their faces and worship and set their hope upon that son of Adam and petition him and supplicate for mercy at his hands. Nevertheless, that Yahuwah of Ruachoth will so press them that they shall hastily go forth from his presence and their faces shall be filled with shame. And the darkness grow deeper on their faces. This is something that's also mentioned. We're going to be made li like light, like the stars. Each one differs in esteem from another. Every believer is going to be having an eternal, internal light from him according to his good pleasure and as a reward for each of us, right? It's the same with the wicked. They're going to be in darkness. And the, the greater your evil, the more darkness you'll be consumed by in that time. It's also mentioned in 4th Ezra, I believe. There's an allusion to this with the light and dark waters also in a parable from 2nd Baruch. <clears throat> and he will deliver them to the messengers for punishment, to execute vengeance on them because they have oppressed his children and his elect. And they shall be a spectacle for the righteous and for his elect. They shall rejoice over them. Because the wrath of Yahuwah of Ruach Oath rests upon them, and his sword is drunk with their blood. And the righteous and elect shall be delivered on that day, and they shall never thenceforward, thenceforward see the face of the sinners and unrighteous. And Yahuwah of Ruach Oath will abide over them, and with that son of Adam shall they eat and lie down and rise up forever and ever. Or Leolam Wa'ed, unto ages and witnessed, right? 
And the righteous and elect shall have risen from the earth and ceased to be of downcast countenance. And they shall have been clothed with garments of esteem. And these shall be the garments of life from Yahuwah of Ruach Oath. And your garments shall not grow old, nor your esteem pass away before Yahuwah of Ruach Oath. Now, your esteem will be like that of Moshe, but it won't pass away. How his face was light when he was speaking to the children, and then he would cover it with a veil. But you have the uh, illusion of the garments not growing old for the, the whole time they were in the wilderness. Their sandals did not wear out and their, their garments did not grow old, right? Chapter 63. In those days shall the mighty and the kings who possess the earth implore to be grant or to implore to grant them a little respite from his messengers of punishment to whom they were delivered, that they might fall down in worship before Yahuwah of Ruachoth and confess their sins before him. And they shall barak and esteem Yahuwah of spirits and say, Baruch is Yahuwah of spirits or Ruachoth and Yahuwah of kings and Yahuwah of the mighty, and remember his name, literally, it has a lot of meaning to it, but it literally is he who, or he will, he cause it to be, or make it present tense or manifested. He who causes it to be is literally what Yahuwah means, what his name, he's the one that causes what is. So it, it, it might sound a little weird, Yahuwah of spirit, but he who causes the, the Ruach Oath, he who causes the kings, he who causes the mighty, he who causes the, the rich, it's all by his hand. Nothing happens without his willing it. He is, he is the all, as it's mentioned elsewhere, the all-powerful, the almighty, right? And Yahuwah of the mighty, and Yahuwah of the rich, and Yahuwah of esteem, and Yahuwah of chokmah, or wisdom, and splendid in every secret thing is your power from generation to generation, and your esteem forever and ever. Deep are all your secrets and innumerable, and your righteousness is beyond reckoning. We have now learnt that we should esteem and barak Yahuwah of kings, and him who is king over all kings. And they shall say, would that we had rest to esteem and give thanks, and to confess our belief before his esteem. And now we long for a little rest, but find it not. It mentions in the uh, Yeshiahu, I believe, a few times, but there is no rest for the wicked. That was another refutation of, of people thinking that after you die, you just sleep. That's not what is actually recorded. We, we've talked about that before, and we'll go over it again, ob willing. But there is no rest for the wicked. You're either you're resting and, and in shalom and joyful at the expectation of your future if you're his. But if you're not, you're confounded and you're not having a good time after death. It says, and now we long for a little rest, but find it not. We follow hard upon and obtain not. And light has vanished from before us, and darkness is our dwelling place forever and ever. For we have not believed before him, nor esteemed the name of Yahuwah of Ruach Oath, nor esteemed our Yahuwah or Master. And remember, the name of the Father was given to his Son from the beginning. He said he comes in his Father's name. You can find it as early as Bereshit, or Genesis chapter 19, where it mentions, And Yahuwah rained fire and sulfur from Yahuwah in the Shemaim upon the five cities. That very verse is explained in the Apostolic Constitutions and in Irenaeus or Irenaeus's against heresies as being the Father giving to the Son his power. The one who stood and spoke on Mount Sinai was called Yahuwah of Esteem, and that was our Mashiach, is our Mashiach. He, it's also mentioned throughout the Renewed Covenant writings that he was given his father's name, and he's literally called Yahuwah, Yahushua, in the epistles, but you don't see it in modern English translations. If you look up what's called the Nomnia Sacra in Latin, which means sacred names, 
It was a phenomenon in the early Greek manuscripts after 300 AD when the Nicolaitan Catholic Christians made the Hebrew language illegal. They banned it from being spoken. They burned everything that was written with Hebrew in it. They could no longer transliterate or just put the Hebrew characters in the Greek text anymore. If you go before 300 AD, you'll find the name Yahuwah written in the Greek manuscripts because they wouldn't substitute it with a title. After 300 AD, they used placeholders. They had two-letter or three-letter words with the lines over them in the manuscripts that would represent different words. Yahuwah, Yahushua, man, when it was talking about the son of Adam, the uh, crucifix, if you will, or the upright stake, the word for ruach, as opposed to spirit, when it was talking about our creator, it was always the placeholder. When it was talking about Satan or just demons, it was just the, the regular Greek word for spirit, if you will, or the Latin word or whatever language they were using, because that didn't matter. But when it was talking about his things, they always used the placeholders. When you look at those placeholders and you check out anywhere in the Renewed Covenant, you find he's, he's talked about as Yahuwah all over the place. In particular, when it says, Yahushua Mashiach, our master throughout the renewed covenant that that word for master should be yahuwah because he is our yahuwah the one who came and spoke to men also foretold in second baruch and elsewhere mentioned and fully made clear in the apostle of constitutions the recognitions of clement um, the hidden writings that we have but even in the common scriptures you can see it again starting in genesis chapter 19 there's two yahuwahs mentioned right there he says himself that no one's ever seen or heard the Father, but men see Yahuwah and Elohim in the beginning, and that's always our Mashiach. So just something to consider as you're reading through Scripture, okay, to keep those things in mind. But he was given the name above every name, right? That's why it's mentioned, nor esteemed our Yahuwah, right here. It says, but our hope was in the scepter of our kingdom and in our esteem. And in the day of our suffering and tribulation, he delivers us not. Remember, we reap what we sow. And we have what comes back to us of the, the words of our own mouth and the works of our hands, right? And in the day of our suffering and tribulation, he delivers us not. And we find no respite for confession that our Yahuwah is true in all his works and in his judgments and his righteousness. And his judgments have no respect of persons. And we pass away from before his face on account of our works. And all our sins are reckoned up in righteousness. Now they shall say unto themselves, Our souls, or inner beings, are full of unrighteous gain. But it does not prevent us from descending from the midst thereof into the burden of the grave, or Sheol. And after that, their faces shall be filled with darkness and shame before that son of Adam. And they shall be driven from his presence, and the sword shall abide before his face in their midst. Thus spake Yahuwah of Ruach Oath. This is the ordinance and judgment with respect to the mighty and to the kings and the exalted and those who possess the earth before Yahuwah of Ruach Oath. All right, shalom again, everyone. This is a post that was from 2016, and I just want to read through it because it covers the fact that all of these things were foreknown. It was mentioned in Hanok, which is one of the first or the first writing. It was the first man to be given chokmah and shown these things from above, and he wrote it down for his posterity, for all of his children, including which is everyone alive today. But it was known beforehand and talked about very clearly it was mentioned it was made known who this was given to specifically and the idea that all the monarchs or the kings of the earth come from yahuda is is easily seen in scripture which we're going to cover right here and even foreknown by yahuda at that time when yaakov came back into the land which is a type of our mashiach after he went out of the land to gather his children and possessions and then he comes back to keep his vow in the, in the seventh month there. It's a foretelling 
of what our Mishiach's doing in this third age, right? Because there's three ages of men, the patriarchs, the time of them being in the land, and then the times we're living in now. Um, when he was there and he kept what we call the Feast of Yahuwah and Yobelim or Tabernacles, he was shown all things that would happen to him and his posterity until the consummation of the times, and he wrote it down. And then he would have shared that with his children. They would have went into Mitzrayim knowing these things, and when, the, when his sons died, they all imparted wisdom or foretellings to their children that was recorded in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. We only have that in a Greek and Latin version in, in its totality. There are some, like we also have the Testament of Amram, the, or the visions of Amram, the Testament of Kohath in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But, um, and we have the Testament of Louis that's mostly complete there in an Aramaic version. And then we have a little bit of Naphtali, Yahuda, and Yahusuf's Testaments that were found amongst them. So it predates the coming of our Mashiach, but it talks about things that were about his coming and amazing things that you wouldn't, that a lot of people didn't believe they would have known at that time. But if you pay attention to what is actually recorded, they knew a lot more than we have fully available. And you can actually see it in their writings. A secondary or a third witness to these things, if you will, is in a book called The Ancient History of Caldonia which takes a, a, a remnant of the Hebrews that stayed true to the laws of the altar when they were in Mitzrayim or Egypt, and they left before the, the murders of the firstborn. They founded the city of Troy, and then they went from Troy to Crete, from Crete to Sicily, from Sicily to what we call Gaul or France, and then to the highlands of Scotland, but they didn't call it that at the time. And that was the remnant that stayed true to the words that they had. When you read their history, they knew the Mashiach was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The sacrifices they did were in, were in uh, remembrance of what he would do. They had foretelling, and they followed what they called the laws of the altar, which were the instructions from Noah, Hanok, Abraham, Jacob, what they were in from the testaments of the 12 patriarchs. How they had the rules for certain things are what you'd find directly from like the testament of Reuben and how he was repentant for seven years before he was brought back and accepted. That was an actual rule that they followed throughout history until the coming of our Mashiach and when they got the, the ten, when they got the full writings of the scriptures. Before that time, they were in seclusion in his good favor for over a thousand years. But you can see what's in there about the coming of our Mashiach that was foreknown to them from the 1200s BC and on at the least which um, Troy was founded um, like around 1500s BC or so. It was shortly 34 years before the Exodus is what they have it as. And then it was destroyed around, what was that? 1181 BC. So just after 1200 BC, when the, the battle or the siege of Troy, but that's for another time. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and read through this post just so we can get all the, the verses in there. <clears throat> it says, Almost all the nobility of Europe, the Middle East, Asia, Africa, and the presidents of America, not to mention the other places that they have presidents, are from the tribe of Yahuda, specifically of the line of Zera and Ferez or Peretz. Okay. And this is why all the monarchs are related in the world. Satan can't contrive these things, but he can't corrupt them, which is what he does, right? Most, if not all, from the line of Dawid now, or David. And it was foretold in a few places that Yahudah's children would be as sea monsters in the earth to men. See how this was promised from of old, and why? See what will happen to all of the unrepentant. May we all come out of the error we find ourselves in. And this is from Yobelim, or what they call Jubilees, chapter 15. And Yahuwah appeared to Abram, meaning our Mashiach, right? And said to him, I am El Shaddai, 
approve yourself before me and be you perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and Yahuwah had talked with him and said, Behold, my ordinance is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be called Abram, but your name from henceforth even forever shall be Abraham. Abram is exalted father. Ab, father Ram, is exalted. And Abraham is an exalted father of them, or the, a multitude of nations, if you will. For the father of many nations have I made you, and I will make you very great, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come forth from you, and I shall establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you, throughout their generations, for an eternal covenant, so that I may be an Elohim to you and to your seed after you. And the land where you have been a sojourner, the land of Canaan, that you may possess it forever, and I be their Elohim. <clears throat> All right, this is the same chapter, but verse 15. And Yahuwah said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, her name shall no more be called Sarai, but Sarah, which means princess. But Sarah shall be her name, and I will barak her and give you a son by her, and I will barak him, and he shall become a nation, and kings of nations shall proceed from him, meaning Yitzhak, okay? And this is Yobelim chapter 31, Yitzhak foretelling about Louis first, and then Yahuda shown below. And, then, and to Yahuda he said, May Yahuwah give you strength and power to tread down all that hate you. A prince shall you be, you and one of your sons, over the sons of Yaakov. May your name and the name of your sons go forth and traverse every land and region. Which literally started happening even before the Exodus. As I was mentioning in the ancient history of Caldonia, the leaders from the, the land of Troy were was Daniel, which became Donald, and the MacDonald clan was the royal clan of the Caldonians that many branched off clans came from that are literally the, the rulers of the monarchies in, in Europe today. Um, parts of them, including presidents, the Kennedys come from them, um, the McAlpines, the Stuarts, which is James I of, of England, but sixth of Scotland was a Stuart which was a branch of the McDonald's that was foretold in the ancient history of Caledonia. Not in a good way, but it was foretold. And as you see, what, what happens here, they're involved with the enemy doing witchcraft and involved with Satanism and persecuting true believers. Just like Yahuda sold Yahusif into slavery. Okay. <clears throat> It says, and to Yahuda, he said, may Yahuwah give you strength and power to tread down all that hate you. A prince shall you be, you and one of your sons over the sons of Yaakov. May your name and the name of your sons go forth and transverse every land and region. Then shall the Gentiles fear before your face, and all the nations shall quake, and all the peoples shall quake. And you shall be the help of Yaakov. And in you be found the deliverance of Yisrael. And when you sit on the throne of honor of your righteousness, there shall be great shalom for all the seed of the sons of the beloved. Baruch be he that barak you, or blessed is he that blesses you. And all that hate you and afflict you, sorry, and curse you shall be rooted out and destroyed from the earth and be accursed. All right. And then Yobelim 32, real quick. And on the following night, on the 22nd day of this month, Yaakov resolved to build that place and to surround the court with a wall and to set it apart or set apart it and make it set apart forever for himself and for his children after him. Just for context, this is Beth El, or the house of El that he named so, 
what was which was formerly lose or lose in the land there and he was going to make a hikel for him but he that didn't happen and yahuwah appeared to him by night our mashiach did and baruch him and said to him your name shall not be called yaakov but yisrael shall be your name or they name your name and he said to him again i am yahuwah who created the shamayim and the earth and I will increase you and multiply you exceedingly. And kings shall come forth from you, and they shall judge everywhere, wherever the foot of the sons of men has trodden. And I will give to your seed all the earth which is under Shamayim, and they shall judge all the nations according to their desires. And after that, they shall get possession of the whole earth and inherit it forever. And from the testament of Yahuda, it says, and now, so Yahuda would be given over as monarchs, right? But his children would inherit all the earth. However, everyone that becomes a believer, if you're not of the literal seed, or if you are, you're grafted in to Yisrael. So that, that's what he's talking about. It's always been the, the literal children and the mixed multitude. Okay. It's always been the literal children in the mixed multitude. All right. And now that we've covered what was in Yobelim about the succession of where the monarchs would come from, specifically Yahuda, and that they would be ruling over the whole earth, everywhere the sons of men's feet have trodden. You can see that he foreknew this, and he even talks about it in his testament. This is from the testament of Yahuda, chapter 21. <clears throat> It says, and now, my children, I command you, love Louis, what they call Levi. Louis in Hebrew literally means joined unto me, right? It says, love Louis that you may abide and exalt not yourselves against him, lest you be utterly destroyed. For to me, Yahuwah gave the Malkuth, or kingdom, and to him, the Kahuna. And he set the Malkuth, or the kingdom, beneath the Kahuna. To me, he gave the things upon the earth. To him, the things in the Shamayim. As the Shamayim is higher than the earth, so is the Kahuna of Elohim higher than the earthly reign. Unless it falls away through sin from Yahuwah and is dominated by the earthly reign. For the messenger of Yahuwah said unto me, Yahuwah chose him rather than you to draw near to him and to eat of his table and to offer him the first fruits of the choice things of the sons of Yisrael. But you shall be king of Yaakov and you shall be amongst them as the sea. For as on the sea, righteous and unrighteous are tossed about some taken into captivity, while some are enriched, so also shall every race of men be in you. Some shall be impoverished, impoverished, being taken captive, and others grow rich by plundering the possessions of others. For the kings shall be as sea monsters, they shall swallow men like fishes. And if you remember, in Revelation, it talks about the or the coming of the lawless one. It was until that which restrains is taken out of the way. What restrained is explained by Tertullian, I believe, in the anti nicene writings. But he mentions that it was the pagan Roman Empire that had to be taken away when it was the Gothic or Germanic hordes came in and destroyed pagan Rome and broke it up into ten kingdoms. Three of those were plucked up those kingdoms were destroyed and then the fullness of the anti-mashiach or the coming of the lawless one was fully made known it had happened it had been budding and happening since the 300s but it fully culminated around the 600 cent or the 6th century a.d where papal power was given monarchy by the behest of the kings that were around it okay and they were like the sea monsters or the heads of that beast if you will for the kings shall be as sea monsters, they shall swallow men like fishes. The sons and daughters of free men shall they enslave. 
houses, lands, flocks, money shall they plunder, and with the flesh of many shall they wrongfully feed the ravens and the cranes, and they shall advance in evil, in covetedness uplifted, and there shall be false prophets or foretellers like tempests, and they shall persecute all righteous men. And Yahuwah shall bring upon them divisions one against another. This is just like the curse that was given to Dawid that the sword would not leave his house because of what he did. The monarchs of the world have been fighting against each other, even brothers that were all from the same mother. At one point, um, mo half the monarchs of Europe, I believe, were literally all brothers and sisters. They used to come together and, and, and have meals together and party and they'd be in union in fellowship with one another but because of jesuits and the machinations of satan there was actually they're the ones that brought on world war one this is in yahua shall bring upon them divisions against one another and there shall be continual wars in israel and among men of another race shall my kingdom be brought to an end until the deliverance of israel shall come now, after the Babylonian captivity in the land there, they came back. They were not kings for a time. They were, they were governors. And that was foreshadowing after the mystery Babylonian captivity with the coming of the Reformation. Then you had what sprung up from them was popular governments like in America, where we no longer had kings, but governors. And that was something that was brought about with the whole world. So it was a foreshadowing of those things, but you, but th that was still the sons of Dawid or the sons of Yahuda reigning during that time until Edom came in. You had the, the Greeks that were suppressing them, and then after the deliverance from the Maccabees, the Maccabees were made king and Kohanim. They were of the sons of Louis directly, but they had intermarried with the line of Yahuda all the way back from the time of Aaron. If you recall, Aharon, Moshe's brother, the first Kohen, married the daughter of Nahash, who was the leader of the tribes of Yahuda in the wilderness. So all of his children would have been of Yahuda and Lui. You had more intermarriage within those two tribes for the line of Dawid, and even to the coming of our Mashiach, which is why Miriam, who was of the, the seed of Dawid, according to the flesh, was cousins with Elisheva, or Elizabeth, who was of the sons of Aaron, if you will, or the, the seed of Aaron, Aharon. But um, it was through intermarriage, and that's why the Maccabees were able to be reigning and still have that as legitimate, because they were of Yahuda as well. However, when they fought against each other it's also mentioned in the the maccabees in their history in josephus and then the book of gad the seer okay chapter one where he has the vision of the moon with its horns two horns pointing down and touching the ground that was before the coming of our mashiach the two sons of the the line of the maccabees were contending for the reign and through their infighting herod came to power for the first through his father Antipas by the, the will of the Romans and then it was given to Herod and Herod was an Edomite it was during that time that it was foretold that when the lawgiver would not cease from between Yahuda's feet until Shiloh comes and that was the foretelling of that being made manifest in the same way today we had leaders in our country that were overtly of Yahuda until missed you know the foretold edom there which is catholicism okay so the the spiritual edom is roman catholicism that's made uh, known in the uh the book of gad the seer calls edom the katim amos in the per Pershaz and the dead sea scrolls go into great detail about the katim and that was the roman empire and what they're going to do and the Katim are Edom and known as that in a few other places as well. So once you, and that again, in the for those that might not know, in the original covenant writings, um, in the original covenant writings, the uh, 
Shaul makes mention that Hagar is the first covenant at, of Mount Sinai in Arabia. So Hagar being the first covenant, Yishmael would be the first covenant believers who are equated to the wild donkey of a man whose hand is against all their neighbors and all their neighbors against them. And you can see that through the history of the, the uh, kingdom of Yahuda there, right? There, there, that's why Balaam was riding on a donkey. It's why Mashiach came on a donkey to the deliverance of his people. It was foreshowing that kind of thing. It's alluded to in the Psalms. It's alluded to in the foretellings, like a wild donkey in the wilderness. So they were, or like a, a horse. Uh, if you mentioned the horse and a donkey have a bit and bridle to be able to be steered and led because they won't come willingly. That was the type and picture of his original covenant believers who would hear, but not always believe. Yishmael. So the, the uh, Yaakov and Edom were both born in the womb together, but Edom rose up against his brother, forsook his birthright, and persecuted his brethren, which is exactly what Rome did as an assembly. They originally built up as an assembly by Shaul and Kepha, and then they were infiltrated by the Nicolaitans when apostate and brought forth Roman Catholicism, which has been persecuting true believers since that time, like Edom, spiritually. And that's what that was uh, representative of. But being in collusion with that is what the kings are being judged for, right? So it says, And Yahuwah shall bring upon them divisions one against another, and there shall be continual wars in Yisrael. And among men of another race shall my kingdom be brought to an end until the deliverance of Yisrael shall come, until the appearing of the Elohim of righteousness that Yaakov and all the nations may rest in Shalom. And he shall guard the mighty, or he shall guard the might of my kingdom forever. For Yahuwah swore to me with an oath that he would not destroy the kingdom from my seed forever. Now I have much grief, my children, because of your lewdness and witchcrafts and idolatries which you shall practice against the kingdom. You can see this even in the original covenant writings during Kings and Chronicles, right? Following them that have familiar spirits, diviners, and demons of error. You shall make your daughters singing girls and harlots, and you shall mingle in the abominations of the nations. For which things sake, Yahuwah shall bring upon you famine and pestilence, death and the sword beleaguering by enemies and revilings of friends, the slaughter of children, the rape of wives, the plundering of possessions, the burning of the temple of Elohim, the laying waste of the land, the enslavement of yourselves among the nations, everything that happened to Yahuda. And they shall make some of you eunuchs for their wives, which is what happened to Daniel, right? And until you turn unto Yahuwah with perfect heart, repenting and walking in all the commandments of Elohim, and Yahuwah visit you with loving kindness and bring you up from captivity among the nations. All right, and then we have right here where the parable where Yahushua saw to his taught ones, how hard is it for rich, the riches, those that have riches to enter the reign of Elohim? But there's no need to write that one specifically or to read that one specifically but and then again Hanok 62 and 63 which we already covered so no reason to go over that again but thank you all for your time you have a wonderful shabbat i know this is kind of uh not the best way to leave off but it is something to be seriously considerate of where he is not ignorant of anything and he hasn't left us ignorant if we learn and, and pay attention to what he's written so i willing this will help us all to be serious about belief and repent for the things that we do wrong you have a wonderful shabbat and we'll see you next time